Good evening, it's Wednesday, January 26th. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer to retire, giving President Joe Biden an opening he has pledged to fill by naming the first black woman to the high court. Breyer to make his official announcement this week, possibly as soon as tomorrow. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the United States has delivered its written response to a list of Russian demands over Ukraine. The document we've delivered includes concerns of the United States and our allies and partners about Russia's actions that undermine security, a principled and pragmatic evaluation of the concerns that Russia has raised, and our own proposals for areas where we may be able to find common ground. Russia has demanded that NATO guarantee it will not admit Ukraine as a member. Blinken indicates the U.S. has rejected that demand. California Governor Gavin Newsom with a $10 billion plan to fast forward California's transition to zero emission vehicles. A QAnon adherent hit with one of the stiffest sentences yet for participation in the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Three years, eight months months in prison. The Los Angeles City Council approves a measure to ban new oil and gas wells and phase out existing ones. The measure would shut down oil and gas fields in the city after decades of complaints from residents about health problems. And despite mass opposition, the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors votes by a narrow margin to approve a new county jail. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer reportedly plans to retire soon, giving President Joe Biden an opening his pledge to fill by naming the first black woman to the high court. Sources close to Breyer said today his formal announcement may come as soon as tomorrow. Democratic Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said that Biden's nominee will receive a prompt hearing in the Senate Judiciary Committee and will be considered and confirmed by the full United States Senate with all deliberate speed. When he was on the campaign trail, Biden had promised to nominate the first black woman ever to serve on the Supreme Court. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki today. The president has uh, stated and reiterated his commitment to nominating a black woman to the Supreme Court and certainly uh, stands by that. Breyer's departure won't change the 6-3 to three conservative majority on the court since his replacement will be nominated and almost certainly confirmed by a Senate where Democrats have the slimmest majority. We'll also make conservative Justice Clarence Thomas the oldest member of the high court at 73. Breyer's been a justice since 1994, appointed by President Bill Clinton, along with the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Breyer opted not to step down the last time Democrats controlled the White House and the Senate during Barack Obama's presidency. Ginsburg died in September 2020, and then President Donald Trump filled her vacancy with a conservative justice, Amy Coney Barrett. Some liberals and progressives had urged Judge Breyer to retire while Senate Democrats could still vote for his successor, with Vice President Kamala Harris potentially breaking a tie. Breyer's departure from the high court is expected over the summer. Among the names being circulated as potential nominees are California Supreme Court Justice Leandra Kruger, U.S. Circuit Judge Kenja Brown Jackson, prominent civil rights lawyer Sherilyn Eiffel, and Federal District Judge Michelle Childs. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said today the United States has delivered a response to a list of Russian demands over Ukraine. Blinken declined to give details, but said he expects to speak with his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, in coming days. Russia has demanded that NATO guarantee it will not admit Ukraine as a member. Blinken indicate the U.S. had rejected that demand. 
Again, without going to the specifics uh, of the document, I can tell you that it reiterates what we said uh, publicly uh, for many weeks <laughs> and in a sense for many, uh, many years uh, that um, we will uphold the principle of NATO's uh, open door. Um, and that's, uh, uh, as I've said repeatedly in recent weeks, uh, a commitment that, uh, that we're bound to. Blinken did not repeat White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki's warning yesterday that a Russian invasion of Ukraine was imminent, but he urged U.S. citizens still in the country to leave. President Biden charged that Russian President Vladimir Putin is continuing to build up forces along Ukraine's border. He warned that there would be serious economic consequences for Putin, including personal sanctions in the event of an invasion. But Ukraine's foreign minister said he didn't see indications that a Russian invasion was imminent. He said the threat of such an attack, however, remains. They, also, they still lack some important military indicators uh, and uh, systems to conduct such a large full-scale offensive. It doesn't mean that they won't be able to build up uh, this, uh, this force up to the sufficient level uh, within a certain period of time. Con Allenan is a military analyst and former columnist for Foreign Policy in Focus. Speaking this morning and up front, he said Russia doesn't have the number of troops or other military assets properly positioned to carry out an imminent invasion of Ukraine. 127,000 troops for an invasion of a country the size of Ukraine um, is uh, simply inadequate to, to do the job. And most of the uh, material, which is up closer to the border, is equipment. It's not personnel. A lot of personnel has not been moved up that close to the border. They are putting... Um, you know, tanks, um, uh, personnel carriers, uh, artillery, um, etc. Uh, in these uh, kind of uh, parks up fairly close to the border, which is a mirror, actually, of what NATO does, which is that they put their equipment forward and they keep their personnel back. The Russians are doing pretty much the same thing. I think the key thing here is that there's no movement of, um, uh, of air power up close to the border. Air power is not budged. So the idea of an imminent invasion is, is I don't see it in the cards. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov marked the fears of an imminent invasion. He told Russian lawmakers that our Western colleagues have driven themselves up into a militarist frenzy. And Russia warned it would quickly take retaliatory measures if the United States and its allies reject its security demands and continue their aggressive policies. Presidential advisors from Russia, from Ukraine, France, and Germany were in Paris to discuss ways to revive a stalled peace agreement for eastern Ukraine. Russ Cullen reports from Paris. The meeting comes as part of the so-called Normandy format between the four countries. The French president says dialogue must continue with Moscow, but Europe must also prepare a punitive response to any further aggression by Russia. Emmanuel Macron is set to hold a separate call with Ukrainian leader Zelensky and Russian President Putin on Friday. Ross Cullen, Paris. Michael Clare, longtime college professor in peace studies, now a visiting professor and scholar at the Arms Control Association, is comparing the situation to the days before World War I, when the major European powers stumbled into the deadliest conflict the world had ever seen over a dispute in the same geographic region of Ukraine in Central Europe. He explained the thesis of his article in The Nation magazine's website, A New March of Folly in Europe, Can It Be Averted?, to Chris Welsh on The Talkies Show. Uh, you know, Ukraine was once the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. It was a part of the Soviet Union and ruled from Moscow and historically uh, much
much of the country was uh, Russianized. People in the eastern part of Ukraine speak Russian mainly and have strong economic ties to Russia. Uh, so uh, when the breakup of the Soviet Union occurred around 1992, Ukraine became independent, but many of the people in the eastern part of Ukraine really have stronger ties to Russia. Nonetheless, people in the western part of Ukraine think of themselves more as European and have moved to be closer to, to Western Europe, to have aspirations of joining the European Union and ultimately NATO. So it's really a country that's deeply divided, like, like so many other countries around the world. Uh, what's happened is that uh, the U.S. and its NATO allies have been moving the borders of the NATO alliance ever further eastward towards Russia's borders. And NATO has even incorporated other former members of the Soviet Union. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania were all republics of the Soviet Union. Now they're independent countries and members of NATO. And NATO has expanded it to include countries that were part of the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet, the Soviet alliance system comparable to NATO in Eastern Europe, like Poland and Romania and Hungary are part of NATO. So from Russia's perspective, from Moscow's perspective, they see a continuous systemic march of the West, of NATO led by the U.S., increasingly close to their borders, posing extreme security threats. It's, it's as if South America was, uh, was the United States once and, 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 uh, it was the Soviet Union once and, and it's now spread to include Mexico and the Caribbean and Canada, you know, pressing in on their borders. So from their point of view, they're under assault and uh, have there, therefore there, there is this thinking in, in Putin's mind that it's time to push back. Uh, now, the way he's chosen to do that by threatening war is a very extremely dangerous way to get one's way. And, and I, I wish he would uh, choose otherwise. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have some legitimate security concerns for his country. So that's part of the background. Uh, there's much more to say, but, but, but that's the essence of it. It's a security dilemma with NATO seeking to expand eastward and Russia feeling under increasing threat. The Nation Magazine's defense correspondent Michael Clare says, like European leaders before World War I, everyone seems locked into a march of folly to war, amping up the rhetoric and showing little or no inclination for flexibility or compromise. Uh, so Putin made some rather extreme demands. Uh, in my mind, they are, uh, they are unacceptable in full. Uh, you know, the demands are that Ukraine could never be allowed to join NATO and that uh, NATO cease expanding eastward and that NATO remove it, those um, U.S. and other forces from the frontline states, among other things, and called for written response from the U.S., uh, we we just learned that the U that uh, Blinken, the uh, the U.S. ambassador, has delivered the response. The written response hasn't been made public yet, but from from what's being reported, it's yet yet yet. Uh, we're not going to give ground on anything. So neither side is willing to compromise, and. Uh, that that's going to create a, 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 mo a momentum towards uh, violence. And that's what's so alarming about this. You could at least, I mean, I think the Russian demands are unreasonable. So say, okay, Mr. Putin, your, your demands are unreasonable, but uh, you have some legitimate issues here. Uh, let's 
we, we, we could we could find places to compromise. Here are some areas where we can agree. Uh, why does Ukraine have to join NATO? Uh, are, are U.S. soldiers? Our, our listeners, hey, listeners, do you have children or grandchildren? Do you want to see them sent to Ukraine uh, to defend Ukraine in the event of a war with Russia? That's not going to happen. The U.S. is not going to, Ukraine is never going to join NATO. It's not, it doesn't, uh, it, it, it is uh, it, it, unacceptable under NATO's rules. It, it's corrupt. It, um, it, it is divided. And there are all kinds of other reasons. So just say, okay, we'll, let's make Ukraine neutral. Or some other compromise. And then everybody could, you know, have a, a sigh of relief. And then we'll work out on some of those other issues. For God's sake, I mean, it's possible to find a reasonable solution to this. Um, but that's but uh, the Biden administration seems impossible to to do anything but but uh, to, to to say no to everything. And the Russians, of course, are the same. So that's why I'm alarmed. And these military steps, each one of them has a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now that American troops have been put on alert, if Russia does something, they're going to be, they're, you know, the next step is you have to deploy them. And that will create more uh, reason on the Russian side to deploy more troops, which they're already doing. Where are the where where are the steps to slow this down? Who is saying stop? I don't see anything. I don't see anybody. Michael Clare's article on the crisis in Ukraine: a new march of folly in Europe. Can it be averted? Can be found at the Nation Magazine's website. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. U.S. deaths from COVID-19 reached nearly 3,000 yesterday. Even as new cases nationwide appear to be declining, hospitalizations also remain high at 150,000. Deaths are still increasing. About 26,000 people across the country are in the hospital and intensive care units with COVID. White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator Jeff Zeint said some people have already received a free N95 mask that the federal government is distributing through pharmacies and community health centers. We launched the program to, to make 400 million N95 masks available. This is the largest deployment of PPE, personal pr uh, protective equipment, in U.S. history. We just determined that the fastest way to get masks out was through the channels um, that we use for vaccines, including community health centers and local pharmacies. We've already shipped masks out. With case counts and hospitalizations declining, although still high, infectious disease specialist Dr. Anthony Fauci said the country is not yet at the point where the COVID situation can be said to be under control. When you have over 2,000 deaths, 150,000 hospitalizations, and you have people who are now getting infected to the tune of somewhere around 700,000 a day, we're not there yet. Where we want to be is that sufficient control, and control we mean not eradication, like we did with smallpox, that's unreasonable, not necessarily elimination, like we've done with polio and with measles by mass vaccination campaigns, but a level of control that does not disrupt us in society, does not dominate our lives, does not prevent us to do the things that we generally do under normal existence. That would be a level of infection, but more importantly, concentrating on the severity of disease, hospitalizations and deaths that fall within the category of what we generally accept. We don't like it, but we accept it with other respiratory viruses, RSV, paraflu, and even influenza. 
The World Health Organization says there were 21 million new coronavirus cases reported globally last week, and that's the highest weekly number of COVID-19 cases recorded since the pandemic began. The number of deaths was largely unchanged at more than 50,000. Republican Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is blasting the Biden administration after the Food and Drug Administration abruptly revoked the emergency use authorization for the monoclonal antibody treatments the state had been using, forcing Florida to close its treatment sites and cancel a couple of thousand appointments. U.S. health regulators announced on Monday that COVID-19 antibody drugs from Regeneron and Eli Lilly should no longer be used because they don't work against the Omicron variant that now accounts for nearly all U.S. COVID-19 infections. The move came as the Biden administration and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration decided against fighting on appeal, a federal court ruling against its big employer's mandate requiring employees to get a COVID vaccination or to undergo regular testing for the disease. Mary Sherman reports. The Biden administration is withdrawing its vaccine or test mandate for businesses with at least 100 employees. 27 Republican-led states had challenged the mandate, and the Supreme Court ruled it was federal overreach. Meanwhile, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is vowing to fight the White House after the FDA pulled its emergency authorization for two COVID-19 drugs. Outright revoked authorization for two very popular monoclonal antibody treatments that the state of Florida really pioneered over the summer and that we've worked hard to make available uh, to our residents uh, who needed treatment. FDA says the drugs are ineffective against the Omicron variant, which accounts for the majority of cases. But proponents note that the Delta variant has not been fully eradicated. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. California Governor Gavin Newsom and legislative leaders have agreed to spend an extra $1.4 billion combating the pandemic. The money would expand testing and boost hospital staffing statewide. It would also pay for an education campaign that state officials said would battle misinformation. The legislature still must approve the spending before it can become law. California is showing signs the peak of the Omicron wave has passed. Infection rates are falling. Hospitalizations are short of the overwhelming deluge that officials had feared a few weeks ago. Still, more than 15,000 people are hospitalized with COVID. It's a huge figure, but well short of last January's peak of about 22,000 and just half of what officials had feared. The state's projection model shows the number of hospitalizations falling by half to less than 7,700 in another month. The Oakland Teachers Union and the school district have reached agreement on COVID safety protocols. The Oakland Education Association's president said the agreement includes voluntary weekly testing at all schools, high-quality masks for teachers, staff, and students, better outdoor lunch areas for students, extra efforts to cover absences of teachers out sick with COVID. OEA members to vote on the tentative agreement this weekend. German lawmakers are debating whether to impose compulsory COVID-19 shots. As new record daily COVID-19 infections and the country's stuttering vaccination program have forced them into ethical and constitutional dilemmas. Protesters stood in small groups around the Reichstag Parliament building surrounded by police today as politicians within presented cross-party motions. Chancellor Olaf Scholz backs compulsory vaccines for over 18-year-olds, but his coalition government is divided on the issue, and he has told lawmakers to vote according to their conscience. Trent Murray reports from Berlin. While 74% of the German population is already fully vaccinated, the government says it wants to see that number get higher, leading to MPs in the lower house now considering this new proposal. The government also says it's worried that rising COVID-19 infections and the risk of new variants could put a strain on the health system both next winter and autumn. It's still unclear whether the eventual proposal will be able to pass Parliament, with several MPs from the governing coalition already indicating they won't vote for the plan. Trent Murray, Berlin. 
San Jose has voted to require gun owners to carry liability insurance. It's believed to be the first such measure in the country. The council approved a second measure that will levy a fee on gun owners to fund violence prevention services and gun safety programs. Gun rights groups say they'll sue. San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo said he had heard the arguments from opponents and he summed them up. And that is that this is about punishing law-abiding gun owners because crooks aren't going to follow the law. Uh, this won't stop mass shootings or keep bad people from committing violent crime. But Licardo said the majority of gun deaths are not by homicide, they're by suicide. He said just as auto insurance has provided incentives for safer driving and safety feature for cars, gun liability insurance could do the same for firearms possession and storage. To the extent the insurance can spur us to be safer and spur safety innovation in products and services. And incentivize the purchase of those things. So it's gun safes, trigger locks, engaging safety classes, whatever it might be, insurance can make gun owners and their families safer. The San Jose City Council vote came after about 100 people testified for and against the ordinances. I'm a resident of San Jose, registered gun owner and a supporter of the Second Amendment. As a citizen of the United States, I have a right to keep and bear arms as I see fit to protect myself and property. A law-abiding citizen should not have to pay for this right, just like they do not have to pay or should not pay for the, their First Amendment rights to speak, assemble, and worship freely. I'm in tremendous support of this initiative. I believe its focus, which is on trying to prevent accidental deaths, deaths by a, a suicide, is not targeting criminal activity. And given that two-thirds of our deaths of teenagers are by accidental death using guns, it's targeting the specific areas that it can change. The proposed ordinance is part of a broad gun control plan that Mayor Licardo announced following the May 26 mass shooting at the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority rail yard that left nine people dead, including the employee who opened fire on his colleagues and then killed himself. Before the vote, the executive director of the Gun Owners of California said his group would sue if the proposal takes effect, calling it totally unconstitutional in any configuration. Less than a week after gun deaths across Baltimore and a school shooting in Montgomery County, gun law reform advocates and gun violence survivors rallied in the Maryland state capitol. Emily Scott has that story. The groups that gathered at the state capitol want legislative leaders to pass gun safety bills they say would save lives, such as banning ghost guns made from at-home kits that can be purchased online without a background check. A ghost gun was used in a Magruder High School shooting in Rockville on Friday, leaving one student wounded. Melissa Ladd of Maryland Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America says the Magruder shooting took place in her neighborhood and was the first school shooting in Montgomery County. We know that ghost guns are a problem because people who can't normally purchase firearms are able to get a hold of them, no questions asked over the internet. So I think it unfortunately is a really tragic way of highlighting this problem and hopefully really giving us a sense of urgency of finally pass this bill. The rally was hosted in conjunction with Students Demand Action, Marylanders to Prevent Gun Violence, Brady United, and the Giffords Law Center. State Senator Susan Lee introduced on Monday Senate Bill 387, which would regulate ghost guns in the state. The rally was part of Moms Demand Action's annual advocacy days at the beginning of the legislative session. Ladd says the group will meet virtually with 144 lawmakers today to discuss other policy priorities they'd like to see addressed. We believe that we can tighten up some of the police reform work that was done last year. One part that got carved out, unfortunately, was a qualified immunity bill. And that is a bill that would allow police officers to be held liable if they were to shoot someone without reason. Last Wednesday, multiple shootings in Baltimore took three lives and injured four people. In an average year, 743 Marylanders die in gun-related incidents, according to Every Town for Gun Safety. I'm Emily Scott with Maryland News Connection. You're listening to the evening news on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno. Online, kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast airing each night at 6. 
The newscasts, all of them, are archived online at kpfa.org. You can listen to them whenever you like. They're also available as podcasts. I'm Mark Miracle. Governor Gavin Newsom is touting a $10 billion plan to fast-forward California's transition to zero-emission vehicles. He came to Palo Alto to outline a proposal that's part of his larger plans to address climate change with a focus on equity in underserved communities. Christopher Martinez files this report. Governor Gavin Newsom traveled to the Ford Greenfield Labs in Palo Alto Wednesday to talk about his plans to ramp up California's zero-emission future. It's time to move forward with an oil-free future in California. We see that bright light, and California is going to make sure we ignite it for the rest of the globe. Newsom spoke at a news conference broadcast on his YouTube channel, though the sound quality was not perfect. He's proposing to spend $6.1 billion to accelerate the move to zero-emission vehicles. That's on top of last year's budget funding for a total of $10 billion. We have the opportunity, as the mayor said, to be part of one of the broadest and most dynamic transformations of our economy in modern times. You want to be big? Many have said you got to be big in big things. This is a big thing. This is a big deal. Newsom says more than half of California's greenhouse gas emissions are linked to transportation and oil extraction. He says his plan will address the climate crisis in California and beyond. Extreme weather, extreme drought. The hot's getting a lot hotter. The drier is getting drier. The wet's getting wetter with all these atmospheric rivers. California is on the tip of the spear in terms of the effects of climate change and extremes, but we also are in the leading edge of innovation, leading edge of addressing uh, with a resilient mindset these anxieties, not just for the country, but for the globe uh, more broadly. The state already has a goal of having all new cars be zero emission by the year 2035. The new plan includes $665 million in rebates for low-income residents, as well as money for charging stations and manufacturer incentives. The zero-emission vehicle plan is part of a larger, nearly $38 billion proposal to address climate change on multiple fronts. $37.6 billion if we're successful broadly in this year's budget to invest in the climate space to future-proof the state of California. Give me a country investing that kind of money. There's certainly no subnational that's doing that. And I imagine only a couple of countries in the world, and I'm assuming, I'm assuming when the budget is successfully passed uh, with the enhancement under BBB or whatever version they put out through the president's leadership, that the United States will, uh, will take the mantle of leadership once again. But California, in the absence of that, is going to lean into the future uh, and is going to continue this transformation. Newsom was joined by local elected officials and advocates. Alvaro Sanchez is the vice president of the nonprofit Greenlining Institute, a group that works on economic opportunities for communities of color. He praises the plan's focus on equity. Ultimately, this isn't just about fighting climate change and reducing pollution. It's also about removing barriers so that everyone, not just the privileged few, can benefit from this clean energy technology. Because if we do anything less, we would be creating new frontiers of redlining. The fate of Newsom's zero-emission vehicle plan, along with the rest of his proposed budget, is now in the hands of the legislature, which will be debating the budget over the coming months. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. The Los Angeles City Council has approved a measure to ban new oil and gas wells and phase out existing ones. The measure was shut down oil and gas fields in the city after a decade of complaints from residents about health problems, nosebleeds, wheezing, coughing. They blamed air pollution from the sites. Activists say that black and Latino residents of the city are the most affected by pollution from the sites. An environmental group says the federal government failed to protect endangered whales and other animals by underestimating the potential for an oil spill like last fall's pipeline leak off the Orange County coast. 
A lawsuit filed by the Center for Biological Diversity says federal agencies neglected to ensure that offshore oil and gas production wouldn't jeopardize endangered and threatened species. The lawsuit says the National Maritime Service in a 2017 analysis underestimated the potential size of an oil spill off the coast. It's the latest in a series of lawsuits filed over the spill off the coast of Orange County. Last year, a federal grand jury charged the pipeline operator with failing to heed alarms alerting workers to the break in the pipeline. Meanwhile, California lawmakers held a hearing to explore ideas for decommissioning offshore oil production. South Coast lawmakers are pressing their efforts to safely shut down oil production following that last October oil spill off the coast of Orange County. Elizabeth Santos reports. Halfway through the hearing, Democratic Assemblymember Mike Gibson of Carson recalled an analogy that captures the challenge lawmakers face when it comes to decommissioning offshore oil facilities. I'm also reminded of a quote from a a gentleman who I served with. Uh, He said, do you want me to save the tree or the person under the tree? Gibson's referencing the tug of war between the environmental health of the California coastline and oil industry jobs. The oversight hearing about decommissioning offshore oil drilling infrastructure comes months after about 25,000 gallons of crude oil spilled into the ocean off Huntington Beach. The impact of the spill was less than initially feared, but it affected local wetlands and wildlife and shut the shoreline in a surf-loving coastal community for a week. Onshore, local businesses and restaurants endured an economic blow as tourists were forced to go elsewhere. In response, Assemblywoman Koti Petri Norris, a Democrat representing Laguna Beach and chair of the Select Committee on the Orange County Oil Spill, wants to improve oil spill prevention strategies in the state. The, the clear lesson, both from that hearing and from this disa- from the disaster that uh, resulted in the creation of our Select Committee, is really clear. When we drill, we spell. And the goal of today's hearing is to build our knowledge and our understanding uh, for all of the factors that we need to consider as we look to decommission offshore oil infrastructure off the coast of California. There are 27 offshore oil platforms in California. Eight are shut down and in the decommissioning process. The length and cost of the process varies depending on the structure itself. According to the California State Lands Commission, complete decommissioning of a facility could take between 5 to 10 years and cost between $400 to $500 million. Complex ecological issues play into the process as well. Environmental reviews at federal and state levels would need to be done before complete decommissioning could take place. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, as of 2019, California was the nation's seventh largest producer of crude oil. Some lawmakers brought up the possibility of a job retraining program that would help oil industry workers phase into a clean energy future. But Tyson Bagley, president of United Steelworkers Local 326, wants to keep oil production in the state and says the industry changes lives. When I listen to people from environmental groups talk about just transition for our members to transition into other jobs and career avenues, that is not what we're interested in. We are proud of what we do. I came from a very unique background. I was a professional baseball player for the San Diego Padres for five years before I started working here. When I made my decision to come in and get into the workforce, I chose the oil and gas industry because they provide living wage careers for men and women. Other advocates of the oil industry say it welcomes various backgrounds, including those who may face barriers finding employment. Veterans and formerly incarcerated individuals have found stability and rewarding careers. One decommissioning alternative is a rig to reef program. Existing oil rigs, instead of being completely removed, would be converted to artificial reefs. The well would be sealed and capped but the structure would be modified for marine life to thrive. In 2010, Republican Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger signed the Marine Resource Legacy Act, allowing for the rig to reef conversion. Amanda Sparks, 
marine biologist and president of Blue Latitudes, explains why this hasn't happened in California. Due to some of the legislative issues within the law, it doesn't incentivize the oil companies or the state to really participate. Many of these issues are with the liability associated with the platform jacket itself. So since its signing in 2010, none of our platforms have been reefed. Rig-to-reef conversions of oil platforms are being considered off the Louisiana and Texas coasts and internationally in Asia and Africa. I'm Elizabeth Santos reporting for KPFA. California Attorney General Rob Bonta today announced a milestone in a $26 billion settlement with some of the pharmaceutical companies that caused the opioid crisis. The settlement could bring $2 billion to help the state address addiction now that 400 cities and counties have signed on to the agreement. Christina Onstad reports. California Attorney General Rob Bonta says the state is one step closer to reaching a $26 billion settlement with some of the largest companies that have fueled the nation's opioid crisis. Today we are here to announce the next step in this process and a major milestone. Well over 400 California cities and counties representing over 97% of our state's population have now signed on to this historic settlement. As a result of these local governments signing on, California now stands to receive close to our full share of the $26 billion national settlement, which is over $2 billion. The settlement comes as a result of investigations by California and more than a dozen other state attorneys general into whether the nation's top three pharmaceutical distributors, Amerisource Bergen, Cardinal and McKesson, fulfilled their legal duty to refuse to ship opioids to companies that submitted suspicious drug orders. It also settles an investigation into whether pharmaceutical company Johnson & Johnson misled patients and doctors about the addictive nature of opioid drugs. When finalized, the settlement will resolve the claims of states and local governments across the country, including nearly 4,000 that have filed lawsuits in federal and state courts. Bonta says the $2 billion slated for California will help bring desperately needed relief to those struggling with opioid addiction. Mothers, sons, fathers, daughters, friends pushed into the tentacles of addiction. During this crisis, over 1 million Americans have died from an overdose. So tragic. Fathers found dead alone on cold sidewalks. Mothers dead behind locked doors discovered by their children. Today's announcement can't bring back those lives. It can't heal the devastating pain families still cope with, but it can prevent future death, future pain. It can provide our cities and our towns with the resources that they need to tackle this epidemic. The settlement also includes industry changes, Bonta says, will help prevent another crisis of its kind. Companies have until February 25th Payments could begin in April. Bonta's announcement comes on the heels of another opioid settlement his office announced earlier this week with McKinsey and Company for more than half a billion dollars, of which California is set to receive nearly 60 million. And California still has another lawsuit pending with Purdue Pharma for driving the nation's opioid crisis. That could bring in more money to help the state battle an epidemic that killed more than 68,000 people in 2020, according to the latest figures from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm Christina Onestead, reporting for KPFA. A man who identified himself as a believer in the QAnon conspiracy theory was sentenced today to three years and eight months in prison for assaulting police officers at the Capitol during last year's insurrection. Nicholas Langerand called himself a patriot, but the judge who sentenced him said Said, the rioters who invaded the Capitol on January 6, 2021, don't deserve that description. The Patriots were the police officers who were defending the Capitol building and our democratic values, said U.S. District Judge John Bates, before handing down one of the longest prison sentences for a Capitol rioter so far. Langerand also told the judge that he was a QAnon follower. 
The conspiracy theory centers on the baseless belief that former President Donald Trump was waging a secret fight against a Satan-worshipping, child-sacrificing cabal of deep state foes, prominent Democrats, and Hollywood elites. Another core belief of QAnon adherents is that Trump would orchestrate mass arrests, military tribunals, and executions of his enemies. QAnon has been linked to a string of violent crimes. The FBI has warned law enforcement that conspiracy theory-driven extremists have become a domestic terrorism threat. It was never meant to be something violent, said Langerand, who pled guilty to a felony assault charge in November. But according to Assistant U.S. Attorney Robert Juman, Langeron repeatedly assaulted police at the Capitol, throwing wood and an audio speaker at officers, and later bragged about his actions on social media. U.S. Attorney Juman said Langeron was not caught up in the violence, but sought it out. Federal authorities explicitly have linked more than 30 riot defendants to QAnon. The leader of the Oath Keepers, Stuart Rhodes, and nine other members have pled not guilty to charges, including seditious conspiracy for their role in the January 6th Capitol insurrection. They may go on trial in July. Mary Sherman reports. The leader of the right-wing group Oath Keepers pleaded not guilty to seditious conspiracy for his role in the January 6th Capitol riot. Stuart Rhodes' attorney says claims that he conspired to use force to stop the certification of the 2020 presidential election are fiction. Far-right conspiracy theorist Alex Jones says he met virtually with the House Select Committee investigating the attack and pleaded the fifth on the advice of counsel. Jones noted he wanted to answer questions but feared the committee would twist his words. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. And this is the evening news on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. Hey everyone, this is Brian Edwards Teekert. And I'm Cad Brooks. Weekday mornings, we host Upfront. Two hours of conversation about what's in the news and what should be politics, technology, prisons, police, what's happening in City Hall and at the State House, in Washington and in the streets. That's starting at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is bracing for the conclusions of an investigation into allegations of parties at his home and office that violated COVID lockdown orders in force at the time. Johnson's office has promised to publish the report's findings, and the Prime Minister will address Parliament about it soon after. Senior civil servant Sue Gray is believed to have concluded her investigation but would not comment on the timing of the report's release. During a raucous session of Parliament, Labor Party leader Keir Starmer called on Johnson to resign and said he must do so if shown to have broken the ministerial code of ethics by lying to Parliament. If he misled Parliament, he must resign. Yes. On the 1st of December, the Prime Minister told this House, in relation to parties during lockdown, all guidance was followed completely in number 10 from that dispatch box. On the 8th of December, looks quizzical, he said it. On the 8th of December, the Prime Minister told this House, I have been repeatedly assured since these allegations emerged, there was no party. So since he acknowledges the ministerial code applies to him, will he now resign? Mr. Speaker, uh, but you know, uh, since he asks, since he asks, since he asks about about COVID restrictions, uh, let me just remind the House and indeed remind uh, the country that he has been relentlessly opportunistic. The Metropolitan Police said yesterday they had opened a criminal investigation into some of those gatherings. The public has been infuriated by what's known as the Partygate scandal. Many people missed weddings, funerals, birthday parties as they abided by the lockdown measures. Despite mass opposition, the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors has voted by a narrow margin to approve a new jail. Nika Mirpur reports. The approval of the new jail in Santa Clara County is a highly controversial move. 
The $390 million jail was approved by a slim 3-2 vote, with Supervisors Cindy Chavez and Susan Ellenberg voting against it, and Supervisors Jim Simidian, Otto Lee, and Mike Wasserman voting for it. The new 500-bed facility will be located at the main jail in San Jose. Public comments lasted about three hours long with nearly all of them being strongly against the building of the new jail, like Amber Mopris with the African American Community Service Agency. I oppose building a new jail and I am in favor of creating opportunity and rehabilitation services to help solve the mental health and substance abuse crisis in our county. Creating such services will help our county so much more than if we build a new jail. I do not support any any system that disproportionately locks up our black and brown community. We need alternatives to incarceration. We have developed trusting relationships with our community here at the AACSA and understand the direct services needed that focus on mental health and substance abuse to help them get better. Fix what is broken within the walls that we currently have. We don't need a new building to do that. Supervisor Susan Ellenberg, one of the no votes, also alternatively proposed having a dialogue with the public about community-based alternatives to incarceration and expanding mental health funding. Incarceration of any resident may represent some gap in the county's social safety net. County government, that's us, we have the power to provide and expand county resources and programs and other efforts to ensure that people's basic needs are met and that they aren't locked up due to a lack of sufficient mental health or substance use disorder treatment, supportive housing, health care, appropriate crisis inter intervention, and so much more. We have the opportunity today to say that we will redouble our efforts in those arenas and see how much safer we can make our community before, if at all, uh, building, another, building another jail. While Jim Simidian, Otto Lee, and Mike Wasserman voted against Ellenberg's proposal, they did agree to consider building new mental health facilities and expanding new mental health and drug abuse treatment options in the county at a later date. Santa Clara District Attorney Jeff Rosen, speaking on behalf of the District Attorney's Office, spoke in support of both a new jail and more treatment facilities. We need a jail, we need a humane jail that protects and promotes human dignity and facilitates and encourages rehabilitation for those that are inside of it. Uh, we also need more mental health and drug treatment options for everyone in our county. We use our jail in Santa Clara County sparingly and carefully for those, for only those who are too dangerous to release or are flight risks. Fewer than 10% of individuals charged with crimes are held in our jail. So we're talking about 90% or more that are safely released. Our jail incarceration rate, to remind you, is among the lowest in California and the United States, more than 40% lower than the average. But many of the opponents of a new jail point out the maximum security facility with long isolation periods would exasperate conditions that lead to crime. Jails are toxic environments, loss of control over your body, disconnection from community and family, enforced solitude or loss of privacy. All of these cause trauma. A new jail will further the trauma. It will not change things. I understand that anyone who is incarcerated could so easily be my brother. He didn't need a facility when he was a child. He needed trained, well-compensated people to support him and my family. Those places are toxic environments that create loss of autonomy, disconnection from family, and enforced solitude. The county's framework report neglected to do a thorough analysis of the long-term cost benefits of providing housing versus a new jail. Let's spend our tax dollars wisely and stop criminalizing poverty. Critics also pointed out that current sheriff of Santa Clara County, Lori Smith, is under investigation for mismanagement of jail facilities, but supervisors approve the project. It also calls for a plan to demolish parts of the Elmwood Correctional Facility and the main jail. These revenue bonds will pay for it. For KPFA Pacifica Radio, I'm Nika Mirpur. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi will be seeking re-election, ending speculation that she would retire as Democrats face the threat of losing control of Congress in the 2022 midterms. The 81-year-old Pelosi said in an online video that the upcoming election is crucial and nothing less is at stake than the U.S.'s democracy. Mary Sherman has a story. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she's running for re-election in this year's midterms. Our democracy is at risk because of assaults on the truth, the assault on the U.S. Capitol, and the state-by-state -state assault on voting rights. This election is crucial. Nothing less is at stake than our democracy. 
The California Democrat turns 82 in March and had previously promised to step down as House leader after 2022. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. Pelosi has served in Congress since 1987. Saheed Buttar is again challenging Pelosi, Pelosi in the Democratic primary from her left in a statement. He says he's watched Pelosi misrepresent San Francisco for 20 years. He said he has a track record of having gotten it right on every issue that she has gotten it wrong from the climate crisis and civil rights to runaway militarism policing surveillance and the mass detention of immigrants the federal reserve signaled today that it will begin a series of interest rate hikes in march reversing pandemic era policies that have fueled hiring and growth and stock market gains, but also stubbornly high inflation. Chair Jerome Powell said at a news conference that inflation has gotten slightly worse since the Fed last met in December. He said raising the Fed's benchmark rate, which has been pegged at zero since March of 2020, will help prevent high prices from becoming entrenched. Seeking to calm fears that higher rates might hurt the economy, Powell said the central bank can manage the process in a way that prolongs growth and keeps unemployment low. I think there's quite a bit of room to raise interest rates without threatening the labor market. This is, by so many measures, a historically tight labor market. Economists said they were surprised by the likely timing and intensity of rate hikes sketched out by Powell, who said the economy is stronger now than in 2015 when the Fed began to raise rates slowly. The Fed's rate hikes will make it more expensive over time <clears throat> to borrow for a home, car, or business. The Fed's intent is to temper economic growth and cool off inflation, which is at a 40-year high and eating into a Americans' wage gains and household budgets. Prince Andrew's lawyers asked a U.S. court in New York again today to throw out a lawsuit accusing him of sexual abuse, citing multiple legal defenses. Among them, the lawyers said that if any sexual activity did occur between the prince and Virginia Drifray, it was consensual. The court filing made clear that Andrew wasn't admitting any sexual contact with her, but it said if the case wasn't dismissed, the defense wants a trial in which it would argue that her abuse claims are barred by the doctrine of consent. Andrew has strenuously denied Jufre's allegations and attempted to get the lawsuit tossed, but earlier this month, Judge Lewis Kaplan rejected his attempt to win an early dismissal, allowing depositions and other evidence gathering by both parties to move forward. Sarah Walton reports from New York. Prince Andrew formally responded to allegations against him on Wednesday with an 11-page court filing. In it, he requested a trial by jury and denied all allegations made against him by Virginia Giffre. Giffre claims she was forced to have sex with the royal when she was 17 after she was introduced to him by former financier Jeffrey Epstein. I'm Sarah Walton in New York. The Coast Guard recovered one body and is keeping up the search for 38 other people missing from a capsized boat after a solitary survivor was found clinging to the overturned hull off the Florida coast. The Coast Guard says the group of 40 left the island of Bimini in the Bahamas Saturday evening in what they suspect was a human smuggling operation. Their survival told them none wore life jackets as they capsized in severe weather. Shifting winds and increased humidity have helped firefighters make progress against the blaze burning in the rugged mountains near the Big Sur coast. Cal Fire said last night the Colorado fire was 50% contained. Cal Fire said investigators determined the fire was caused by the winds blowing hot embers from a homeowner's pile burning. Sunny tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the low 60s in the central San Joaquin Valley. Sunny skies, highs in the mid-60s and sunny in Los Angeles with highs in the low 70s. That's it for the news for this Wednesday, January 26th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. Santana. You know, every time I take a solo on my guitar, I'm telling a story. So I learned from my father in 
and B.B. King and Miles. The reason I mention all of them is because I am them. I, I, I identify with their spirit. All of them taught me to tell a story. I am a master storyteller, you know, and, and, uh, and I utilize melody or friends like you, uh, your heart and your pen and journalists to pass the word through the stories. Miracles and blessings are very close to you. Will you come forward and receive them? KPFA, storytelling for social change. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.